space stations. British Airways say they may delay their flights as America's Skylab space station falls to Earth in the next 36 hours. Some countries say they'll stop all their flights as Skylab comes down, but the chances of it hitting anyone are said to be very remote. Tonight's check on the 85 tons of Skylab shows that the space lab's less than 120 miles up and will fall out of the sky late tomorrow or early on Wednesday. Skylab's next close approach to Britain will be at half past 11 tomorrow morning. It'll cross the Scillies and Guernsey. Our science editor Peter Fairley assesses the chances of anyone being hit by Skylab. If anyone sold your hat to stop bits of Skylab falling on your head, and several thousand have been sold in America, you've probably wasted your money. The team of British scientists who've been tracking Skylab for ITN now predict it won't fall on Britain. There were fears that it might hit Cornwall, but its orbit now is taking it further south. But it will fall somewhere, because what goes up must come down. And according to the North American Air Defense Command, who are using computers to plot its descent second by second, 90% of the world's population, that's four billion people, are theoretically at risk. The dying moments of Skylab are expected to occur somewhere along a line 50 degrees either side of the equator. The 85-ton spaceship, the biggest thing ever put into space, will begin to disintegrate as it hits really thick air layers. The friction will build up until the whole thing has turned into a fireball. Two questions remain. What bits will reach the ground and survive re-entry, and will they hit anyone or anything? NASA tonight put the odds at 152 to 1 against, but nevertheless they've got lawyers standing by in case of mishaps and court claims. There are eight bits which may reach the ground. Six oxygen tanks weighing more than a ton each and made of titanium. One lead-lined film vault weighing nearly two tons. And the biggest piece of all, the fixed airlock shroud, 22 feet long, made of aluminium and weighing two and a quarter tons. All these are likely to hit the Earth at 260 miles an hour. So what are the chances of it hitting land? Well, NASA has one card up its sleeve. The small manoeuvring engines aboard Skylab still have some fuel left in them. And in the final stages, if computers predict that the debris seems destined to land on populated regions, scientists at Houston will try to fire the whole lot together and push Skylab into an ocean. We won't know until the last two hours. Skylab was launched in 1973 to explore the problems of men living for long periods in space. It was occupied by three crews, nine men in all, the longest living aboard for 86 days, then a record which the Russians have subsequently beaten. The Americans hoped it would never come down at all. They planned to keep on raising it in orbit using the space shuttle as a kind of pushing vehicle, but they miscalculated. During the last three years, the sun has been unusually active, and the solar wind, which the sun puffs out, has forced Skylab down faster than gravity would normally do. And the shuttle, on which so much depended, has not even made its maiden flight yet. So there's an awful lot of tension and nail-biting going on in American space headquarters at this moment. Team in danger! Code Red! Lift off! 
This is Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship. Off of control, we have contact. You can jettison the cockpit and engines, then link them up. It's Mini Eagle One in visual contact. Off of control, hookup is a go. And their Eagle One rescue phase is complete. Eagle One, Roger and L. Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship comes with three inch figures. Assembly required, you from Mattel. For centuries, man has searched the heavens for signs of intelligent life. Now, the search has ended. What you are about to see is top secret. Ken Berry. Plain incredible! McLean Stevenson. Holy mackerel. Harry Morgan. We're up against genius. Sandy Duncan. Oh, swell. Who is the pilot? It's Walt Disney Productions. <laughs> the Cat from Outer Space. Rated G. It's littering theaters with laughter everywhere. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Last off for another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel. In the story of Expedition to a new moon. We find Taurus, Crystal, Scott, and Professor Mace aboard the Evening Star, discussing plans for colonizing a new moon. But Father, what's so unusual about a new moon? This moon resembles our Earth so much, we think it may have an atmosphere. And if it has an atmosphere, it can be colonized. Aye, we can use a little more productive land in this solar system. Precisely why you're going there, Taurus. We need a complete survey. Then we'll have to make a geological survey as well. Right. Your ship is outfitted with all the necessary equipment. Of course, Chris. We'll be taking the new survey ship. Scott, have you had a chance to look over the new ship since your return? Not yet, Professor. We'd better go down and check it out now. Good. It's being outfitted in tube three. The chief expects you to blast off at 6.03 a.m. Earth time. Aye, we're no sooner than get back to home base and here we go again. Now, Taurus. Father has just explained that the target is approaching orbital position for blastoff. Otherwise, we'll have to delay the project for another year. Notify the chief. We'll make the deadline, Professor. Come on, gang. Let's get going. You and Taurus tested the surveyor, didn't you, Scott? Yes, Crystal. But the instrumentation wasn't complete at the time. We still have a lot of equipment to check out. There she is. That's going to be our home for a while. How do you like the surveyor, Chris? It's a beautiful ship. And it's probably the most completely equipped survey ship ever built. With all the equipment necessary to do a geological survey. The control section can be ejected and act as a landing sphere. I'd feel more at home in the Star Duster. This ship is too slow. Horace, this is a survey mission, not a space race. There goes our moonmobile aboard. Travel over any kind of terrain. It's going to come in real handy. Hi, Skipper. I'm glad they remembered spacemen are allergic to walking. <laughs> okay, gang, let's get aboard and check this baby out. Got to be ready for blast off at 0600 in the morning. Now, hear this. Clear the tube for blast off. Crowding. Ten. Nine. Angle of blast off three two zero vector four. Correcting angle. Trajectory angle go. Increasing power. OS three two one zero. Good. 
Hornet approaching target velocity. Count it. Roger. Five, four, three, two, one. Shut off. A-OK, we're in free flight. Boy, this baby's got a kick like a mule. What's the matter, Taurus? Can't you take it anymore? There is more pounds of me to be pressed than there is of you, lass. <laughs> That's for sure. Check the course, Chris. Right on target, Scott. Two points off the Twin Star Mirror. Right. And our flight plan velocity should get us there in 12 space periods. So we may as well relax and enjoy the scenery. Except for one thing, Taurus. We'll be getting into an uncharted area. Turn on your forward viewer and keep a sharp lookout. Okay, Skipper. Where will this new assignment into uncharted areas take Crystal, Scott, and Torrance? Be sure and see the next exciting episode of Space Angel. Another exciting adventure in outer space with Scott McCloud, Space Angel, in the story of Expedition to a New Moon. Scott, Taurus, and Crystal were instructed to board a new survey ship and venture into an uncharted area where they were to explore a new moon. The survey ship is now approaching its destination, where they must land and prepare for their expedition. There it is. Take a look in your viewer. Mirror, the red giant. Look at the size of those suns, Skipper. If we took our solar system and placed our sun in the middle of that red star, Mars would barely touch the surface. That's big. Scott, center focus two zero degrees east and south. There's our moon. Are you sure coming up fast, Skipper? Yes, we're intercepting its orbit head on. Prepare to reduce speed. Aye, Skipper. DX tubes ready for firing, sir. Give us a gravity count, Chris. Point one, point two, three, four, five. Deflect two degrees out. Fire three. Stand by, I'm placing this baby into orbit. We're in orbit, Scott. Horus, fire the landing sphere. Aye, Skipper. We're going to take a trip downstairs. There doesn't appear to be any atmosphere, Scott. We'll soon find out, Chris. We're sure not gonna go without our space helmet. But who's going to watch the store? We can control the surveyor by remote control. When we land, we'll set up a station. That'll be our home base for a while. We'll land this big baby after we prepare a pad. Uh, just thought I'd ask. Eighty thousand feet and dropping fast. Stand by retro rocket stores. Hi, lad. This is strange, Scott. The gravity indicator keeps switching. Now it's negative. There it goes again. Reading. Well, now it's just about double Earth's gravity. So how do you make a landing, Skipper? We may begin hopping like a jackrabbit in another minute. Uh, 40,000. Fire retros. Must be gravity strips. Let's pick one and try it. Aye, Skipper. Pretty fast, Skipper. Phew! Good work, Skipper. That landing was much softer than I expected. I share your sentiments. Now let's roll up the moon buggy and see what the climate's like outside. 
What's the oxygen indicator suggest, Torres? There's an atmosphere, lad, but we can't breathe it. But if there's air... It's frozen. See that funny-looking iceberg? There's your atmosphere. That might just explain the crazy gravity on this moon. How do you mean, Skipper? At double Earth's gravity, the air must have been pulled down and formed into these glaciers. Notice how they appear in rows? Hmm. Well, now that you mention it... Stand by. Something's pulling us over. Well, trapped in their moonmobile on a strange new moon. What will happen to Scott, Crystal, and Taurus? Don't miss the next exciting episode of Space Angels. You're watching Sleep Core, media for insomnia. As the, the real future that's around today. I mean, a man could, could sail and he could go to unknown lands. But today, there's none of that. Today, space is the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, stations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. This is the first voyage of the Space Shuttle Enterprise. Its mission? To make leaving the Earth as easy as flying around it. To begin the economic exploitation of space. To open up the final frontier. Space Shuttle Enterprise is named for the starship eyes of Star Trek. Unlike the starship, the shuttle won't find new civilizations, but it may help found new civilizations. Human settlements in space, giant habitats like these, in which tens of thousands of people will live and work, exploiting the resources of space for the benefit of Earth. This is for the future. The space shuttle's roots lie in the past, in the old way of getting into space. December 1972 the night launch of Apollo 17, carrying the last men to visit the moon. It was the conclusion of a space program that had left many on Earth disillusioned, and by the end, bored. Apollo 17 was also a turning point for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. It had put America on the moon, building for the task the giant Saturn V rocket, now a technological dinosaur. A new approach was needed. Head of NASA's Office of Space Flight, John Yardley. The Apollo program and its predecessors, uh, Gemini and Mercury, had been basically designed just to get into space and to do specific tasks in space. We were actually learning if we could do it at all. It became apparent then, at the, as we were landing on the moon, that we needed, if we were going to use space in any gross way, we needed a better means to do this. The Saturn V launches cost two to five hundred million each. So the idea of the space shuttle uh, came into being. In September 1976, the theme from Star Trek heralded the space shuttle's debut at the Rockwell plant in Downey, California. On hand were two Star Trek regulars, Dr. McCoy and Mr. Spock. Star Trek fans in a letter-writing campaign had succeeded in having the first shuttle named Enterprise. And NASA, sensing a new and younger constituency for space, was happy to go along. The Enterprise is the first of five similar space planes or orbiters. Its first journey was across the Mojave Desert on its way for flight testing. Its extraordinary shape is the result of its extraordinary task to be launched into space like a rocket to operate in orbit like a spacecraft, and then return to Earth and land like a glider. The essence of the shuttle is its reusability. Each of the five orbiters is expected to make over 100 flights into space and back. The first flights piggyback rides on a converted jumbo jet, tested the shuttle orbiter's aerodynamics.
To save weight, the Enterprise has no engines of its own to help it fly back to its landing site after a journey into space. And as a result, it's all but unflyable by a human pilot. We're ready to go. Enterprise, go for time. The astronauts who will fly the shuttle orbiter have each practiced the task for months on a simulator. In this duplicate of the orbiter's cockpit, the pilots have learned how to handle a landing. In this case, a landing on a map of Air Force Base. The vehicle landed not a shuttle, but a TV camera mounted on a boom that follows the pilot's every movement. The real shuttle is extremely unstable aerodynamically. To keep it flying, a battery of five computers is needed to help the human pilot. Without these computers, the shuttle would be no more flyable than a brick. Touchdown at 138. Okay, end of run. A small jet aircraft was modified to handle like the shuttle. It gave the orbiter pilot some first-hand experience at flying by computer and of approaching the runway at an angle four times steeper than ordinary aircraft. The shuttle will drop so fast it would beat to the ground someone jumping from 20,000 feet without a parachute. The first free flights of the Enterprise came in the summer of 1977. Hey, we got a GPC light, lost the sink on two, pushing over. And a big X on computer number two. Enterprise, you're clear. The tail cone on the orbiter is there to reduce drag on its first few test flights, allowing it to glide in at an angle much less steep than will be its eventual returns from space. It is really tight, uh, Bo. In fact, I think it's a little uh, better than the old uh, TA field. 40 feet. 30. 20. 15. Okay, the gear is coming down at 270. Getting some dust. 4 feet. The test feet. landings of the shuttle are on the seven-mile-long dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. But when the shuttle returns from space, it will land here on a newly built three-mile runway at the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral. NASA is recycling many of the installations built for the moon program. The 400-foot launch towers designed for the Saturn V are being cut down to accommodate the shorter, stubbier shuttle. This will be the first true spaceport where the shuttle will land, be refurbished, and readied for launch again. This is how it was first planned to launch the shuttle. The orbiter would be carried on the back of a booster rocket that itself had wings. After taking the orbiter to a height of 25 miles, the booster would release it. As the orbiter flew on into space, the booster would fly back for a landing at Cape Canaveral. This design would enable both orbiter and booster to be reused. But the size of the booster, much bigger than a jumbo jet, made its development costs immense. And cost had assumed a new importance at NASA. Everybody knew we could design a shuttle. The question was, could we afford to build one? So cost throughout the program has been uh, as major a function as as design, integrity, safety, and so on. Whereas in the past manned space programs, cost definitely was a second, uh, secondary factor because uh, money was no object in those programs. So now this is the design we ended up with. NASA's chief spacecraft designer, Max Fage. In the launch configuration, of course, we have this arrangement here, which uh, is compact from the standpoint of having it all together, and it's uh, much it's by far the smallest of all the configurations we've looked at. And, and this is, of course, what you would expect when we have tried to reduce the initial investment. We ended up with something small and compact. But it, it is a kind of an unusual configuration for a launched uh, vehicle. The shuttle's unusual design, the result of the cost compromises that have characterized the program, have made it a peculiar hybrid, part reusable, part throwaway. It is taken to a height of 27 miles with the help of two solid strap-on rockets. When exhausted, these are dropped and parachuted back into the ocean, recovered, cleaned up, and used again. The shuttle's own engines continue. The fuel for these engines is carried in an external tank that's half a football field in length. The tank is jettisoned just short of orbit, 
and burns up on re-entry. The orbiter continues into space with small auxiliary engines. The design is unique and poses unique structural problems that center on the fragility of the external tank. To begin with, uh, structurally, it's sort of messy. This tank here is the core of the whole launch arrangement. The empty weight of the tank is around 70,000 pounds, yet we're hanging very large, massive boosters on that tank. E each one of these boosters uh, weighs like a couple of million pounds. Uh, the arbor itself, uh, fully loaded with its cargo, is going to be in excess of 200,000 pounds. So easily, the lightest component turns out to be the heart of the structural arrangement. It, and that is a little uh, worrisome from the standpoint of, of uh, what might happen uh, dynamically to the vehicle. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. For thousands of years, man observed the rising and setting sun, the cycle of seasons, the fixed stars, and those he called wanderers or planets. From these observations evolved his notions of the universe. The naked eye extended its vision through instruments that saw the craters on the moon, the changing colors of Mars, and the rings of Saturn. The fantasies, dreams, and visions of space travel became the reality of Apollo. In 1970, President Nixon announced the objectives of a balanced space program for the United States that would include the scientific investigation of all the planets in the solar system. Of the nine planets circling the sun, only the Earth is known to us at first hand. But observational techniques on Earth and in space have given us some idea of the appearance and movement of the planets and enable us to depict their physical characteristics in some detail. Mercury, only slightly larger than the moon, is so close to the sun that it is difficult to observe by telescope. It is believed to be one large cinder with no atmosphere and a day-night temperature range of nearly a thousand degrees. Venus is perpetually cloud-covered. Spacecraft report a surface temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit and an atmospheric pressure 100 times greater than Earth's. We can only guess what the surface is like. Possibly a seething netherworld beneath a crushing, poisonous carbon dioxide atmosphere. Of Mars, the red planet, we have evidence of its cratered surface photographed by the Mariner spacecraft. In this painting of the planet, seen from its inner moon, dust storms sweep the rust-colored surface. Jupiter, nearly half a billion miles from the sun, is the largest of the planets, larger than 1,300 Earths. It outweighs all the other planets, moons, and debris in the solar system combined. Saturn, encircled by a halo of brilliant white rings, is the second largest planet and is twice as far away as Jupiter. In this rendering, Saturn is seen from its moon, Titan. Uranus is a pale blue-green ball two billion miles from Earth. Traveling a great orbital arc in the intense cold and darkness of the outer solar system. Neptune is the farthest of the giant planets. So far from Earth that no features have ever been seen or photographed. 
Here, Neptune floats above Triton, one of its two moons. Pluto, nearly four billion miles away, is probably a snow-covered rock in the dim light of a remote sun. Only once every 175 years are the major planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, so aligned that a spacecraft can visit all four on a single flight. The last such planetary arrangement occurred in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson was elected president, and the development of the cotton gin stood at the forefront of American technology. The rare opportunity to probe these planets occurs in this decade, the 1970s, and will not recur until the middle of the 22nd century. Until the flyby of Mariner 4 in 1965, it was thought that Mars was much like the Earth. But the photographs of the Martian surface reveal that the planet was more like the moon. Later missions photographed more than 2,000 miles of craters. In fact, the famed canals, once believed by some to be the work of intelligent creatures, proved to be chains of craters. This bright Martian desert either escaped the devastation of meteorite bombardment or was smoothed by some powerful eroding process. Yet Mars apparently has no running water that cuts and fills, so the scouring agent was more likely a windborne material. Another Marscape called Chaotic Terrain brought more surprises to scientists and more questions to be answered. It appears as a maze-like region of jumbled ridges and steep ravines. That Mars is a world of contrasts we now know. The newly acquired knowledge has only whetted man's appetite for continued and more thorough investigations of Mars. The early mariners flew within several thousand miles of the Martian surface, gathering and sending to Earth TV pictures and measurements of temperatures, pressures, and atmospheric and surface chemical composition. The exploration of Mars takes on a major new aspect in the present decade with the intensive investigations by the Mariner 9 orbiter and the Viking landing missions. Mariner 9 is designed to operate in Mars orbit for a minimum of three months. Its science experiments are similar to those made two years earlier, but data will be gathered over a much longer period. The single 2,200-pound spacecraft is capable of performing much of the mission originally planned for two orbiting mariners. It arrives at Mars after a five-and-a-half-month flight from Cape Kennedy and powers its way into an orbit that takes it around Mars once every 12 hours. Primarily a mapping mission, the Mariner television cameras photograph about 80% of the planet. Thermal and chemical maps of the same areas are made with data from other instruments. The overlapping wide angle and spot coverage narrow angle pictures are taken at Mariner 9's lowest altitude, about 750 miles. Objects as small as 300 feet across may be seen in the pictures. Mariner's orbit was designed to produce a continuous swath around Mars once each 17 days, making it possible to study seasonal effects on the red planet at 17-day intervals. One objective is to investigate what appears to be a wave of darkening that originates at the poles and spreads toward the equator as the polar caps recede apparently responding to springtime increases in temperature and humidity. During the 90-day period, Mariner 9 transmits to Earth thousands of pictures and several billion other science measurements. Much of this information will be used in planning the 1975 Viking lander mission to Mars. One of the most important and dramatic investigations to be conducted during the next 10 years is the search for life beyond Earth. If extraterrestrial life does exist in the solar system, it is most likely on Mars. For that reason, Mars remains the prime target of the planetary exploration program. The Viking landers will carry life detection instruments right to the surface of Mars for some first-hand field work. The two Vikings are double spacecraft, orbiters similar to Mariner 9, and landers sealed inside biocanisters 
and sterilized to prevent Earth microbes from reaching Mars and complicating the search for life. The lander will touch down gently, then prepare itself for an on-site scientific investigation of the planet. Viking will tell its story in its own voice about its observations on Mars, about the surface, the velocity of the wind, the humidity and pressure of the thin atmosphere, and most important, whether there is any evidence of life now or in the past. Meanwhile, the orbiter remains overhead, keeping watch on the landing site, operating as a relay station, and conducting its own science experiments and photographic mapping. Their missions completed, the orbiters will continue circling the planet with Martian moons Phobos and Deimos for many years. The Viking surface laboratories will remain and may provide landmarks for the first Earthmen who visit Mars.